All right, folks. Hey, my name is Phil Zito, and I'm the founder and CEO of Building Automation Monthly. We are a provider of online training for building automation professionals. So right now, at the time I'm recording this, a lot of schools are starting to close and businesses are starting to close down because of the coronavirus. A lot of people are stuck inside. And I thought to myself, man, you know, we give out our podcast every week. Why not just do a weekly Uns her daily rather unscripted training series on building automation and so that my friends is actually what you are watching right now you're watching part one of this multi-part series and basically what we're going to do is we are going to for however long this uh little virus thing goes on uh every weekday i'm going to be recording and right now you can see I've got 21 days, so I'm hopeful that this is not going to last that long. But I'm going to be recording a topic for you. And my hope is that you're going to come out of this, you know, staying at home thing with a lot more knowledge of building automation. And that people in the future, because I'll put this on YouTube, I'll put this on our website, people in the future can use this as well, just to help them become more aware of what building automation is, how it works, and uh, just in general help out the community. So today's topic is going to be on an introduction to building automation. So in order to get started on this entire journey, I mean, from inputs and outputs to control theory, to IT, to programming, to HVAC, et cetera, et cetera, we really have to know where we're starting. And we're starting at building automation systems, kind of what those are. Now I'm gonna give you a couple of resources. I'll put these in a link below the video that you can go to after the fact. And uh, I encourage you to use these resources, uh, one of which is this Honeywell Gray Manual, which uh, I personally used when I was first getting into this industry. You know, Just a little background on me real quickly in case you don't know who I am. I used to lead the uh, integration program at Johnson Controls. Uh, coming up with all sorts of complex integrations. I've been in sales. I've been in operations. I've led ops teams. I've written a book on building automation, created like 13 courses now. And we've got the fastest growing BAS training business with, at the time of this recording, 5,500 students who are enrolled in our courses. All right, so all that being said, I know a thing or two about building automation. And what I find is when folks start to talk about building automation, the first thing they get mixed up is building automation versus control systems. So this is a building automation controller. Like this one's an integral uh, actuator controller. And what it has, this would most likely go on a VAV box. And then this is just most likely a... Uh, basically like a building controller for an air handler or a small central plant. And what you can see, and let me kind of get some larger icons here, but what you can see as you start to look at these controllers is that they have inputs, they have outputs, they have field trunks. And if none of this makes sense to you, don't worry, because this is just an overview right now. We're going to be going much deeper as this course progresses. But these controllers, they have inputs, they have outputs, they have field trunks to communicate to supervisory devices. Right now, by the way, I just want you to get familiar with these terms. You're hearing me say inputs, outputs, field trunks, supervisory devices. Don't worry about what they mean. Just be comfortable with the terminology. So all of these come together, and the entire collection of all of the supervisory devices, inputs, outputs, field trunks, field controllers, is known as a building automation system. Its purpose is to automate your building. So, you know, it have network engines or supervisory devices connected to field trunks connected to controllers, which process inputs and outputs to make things happen in a building. But it wasn't always this way. You know, it, when this all started, um, so it all started with the thermostat, right? We had thermostats that basically would allow us to turn on radiators or to open louvers or dampers in order to allow fresh air into a building. And that was kind of the limit of things until pneumatics came about. And the reason I have this uh, gray manual on my screen is because 
as uh, you hear me talk, I'm going to recommend that you start to work through kind of this controls fundamentals, where it's going to talk about different types of systems, pneumatics versus DDC versus analog, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what happened basically was we started off with just basic thermostats, like not what you have in your house today, not electromechanical thermostats that basically sense a temperature change and then energize a relay. No, we had just basic contact uh, as metal elements expanded, you would go and make contacts happen, things like that, and not even that complex in the very beginning. Then we moved to pneumatics, which is basically pressurized air, and pressurized air would flow around and through a series of accumulators and regulators and solenoid valves and things like that. You would make things happen inside the building. You would have like your air handling units and your valves and your dampers and your fans and your inlet vanes and all sorts of stuff. And it was all controlled by pneumatics. Well, around 1970, 1980, we started to get into microprocessor controls. So basically, you know, computers were the big thing in the 1970s, everyone, 1980s. Everyone was like, oh my gosh, get a desktop, right? I mean, people could actually afford one now. Well, as all that started to happen, we actually started to have computer chips in our controllers. And this was known as direct digital control. And direct digital control, more so towards the late 80s, uh, what that allowed us to do is actually program our controllers so we could go into software that didn't really look like this. I mean, this is modern GFX, disk tech software, but uh, looks something like this, right? And so this software would then allow us to go and program. And in the beginning, it was actually application-specific controllers where you would actually go into like a graphical user interface or use a set of dip switches and you would pick a pre-configured program. But then we got to what's called free programmable controllers. And so inside these controllers, we could actually freely program them. Now that's all well and good that you could program these DDC systems. That's wonderful and great. Problem was we had no way of really taking this data out of the controller and putting it on a screen like you're seeing right now so that someone could actually do something with it. And that's where these supervisory devices came in, right? So you may have heard network engines, you may have heard of Java application control engines, may have heard of JSES, web soups, whatever you've heard of. The main purpose of supervisory devices originally was to take data from these field controllers and put it into a thick client, so just a stationary desktop that could display data from the field controllers and allow the building operator to interface. And this was a big freaking deal. Like this didn't exist before then. Before then you actually had to go and read gauges. You had to go and change things in your pneumatic system. You didn't have these capabilities, but now with DDC and with supervisory devices and the ability to put these into thick clients, which basically a thick client is software that is in the actual PC in the desktop, and it's not accessed via a web browser like Thin Client. Like nowadays, we use web browsers to access our building automation system, and that is called a Thin Client or a web app, right? Well, we didn't have that. And so, what happened is you had these supervisory devices, and they would then communicate to a user interface. Fast forward, you know, another 10, 20 years. Now we're starting to have web based building automation systems, cloud based building automation systems. We're starting to decouple ourselves from the supervisory device and starting to make it to where we only need to use field controllers and web front ends. And the field controllers are actually smart enough to have a web interface in them. Now, I realize this is 101, this is BAS 101 for you right now. A lot of what I just said probably doesn't make sense. There's a lot of background to it. Like I said, don't worry. We're going to be going through biz BAS inputs and outputs. We're going to be going through control modes. We're going to be going through devices. We're going to take a look at our little control wall that's behind me here, and we're going to have a lot of fun with this. I'm going to try to keep each one of these videos at about 10 minutes. Uh, that way you can kind of catch them in between a break. My goal is that by the end of this whole series, it'll be a couple hours worth of content that you could go through and it'll be a really solid primer on BAS. What I want you to do, so depending on where you're watching this, whether you're watching this on Facebook or on YouTube or whether you're watching this on uh, our website, there's going to be a place where you can ask questions in the comment section. I encourage you to do that. Um, if there's something that you just feel was missed, please.
please reach out. Like I said, tomorrow's going to be much more graphical because we're going to be having the camera and we're going to be looking at actual inputs and outputs. Uh, but today, just a very basic, and I want you to definitely use these links right here. They're going to be below the video in the comments or in the description, depending on where you're watching it. Uh, be sure to check out the rest of our content at buildingautomationmonthly.com. I encourage you to do that. We have 200 plus podcast episodes. We have a bunch of information that would be really valuable for you. And I look forward to seeing you in tomorrow's video. Thanks a ton and take care.